Welcome to the Phase World Podcast. Engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. Introduced by Barry Alexander, a wonderful guest from an earlier episode on the Phase World Podcast. George Co. joined me in episode 24 and 25. This is part one of our conversation. George is going to perform at the faculty room at Harvard on Thursday, February 19th, 2015. I had so much fun recording this interview with George at a piano practice studio at Harvard. We met for the first time during this interview, but strangely, it felt like we had known each other for 20 years. My favorite part? is probably having George play along during the interview while he was giving examples or telling a story. They were more than just sound effects, but rather they were perfectly integrated into our conversation. At 22, so far the youngest guest on my show, George is a pianist, young Steinway artist, and an undergrad at Harvard. He says that growing up in the Asian community, which I totally agree, people are generally obsessed with Ivy League schools. As an adult, he quickly learned that successful people, Harvardians or not, succeeded because of the people they are, not because of the schools they went to. By the way, you will also be surprised by how he got into Harvard and perhaps you should advise someone else to apply to. George had an unusual path to becoming a successful pianist. As a young boy, his mom refused to prescribe medication for his ADHD and instead invited a piano teacher to their home. Today, more than a decade later, George earned the title of a young Steinway artist, appeared with Harvard's prestigious River Charles Ensemble, the Carnegie Hall for more than a half dozen times, and Steinway Hall, which led one critic to proclaim a rising star if ever there was one. He majors in economics at Harvard and founded four startups in the first year and a half before he dropped out for one year to dedicate to piano practice. He shares his joy and struggles during that magical year. What's the purpose of playing music for George? He says that it's about creating an experience that reminds the audience of something important in their lives or inspired in some way. They're not only enjoying music as entertainment, but a piece of reflection. He also talked about being Chinese or Asian American and his obligation as a musician and a friend. George believes that it is our duty to show people our culture. Being part of this ethnic group is part of being American. America is a melting pot. We are a group of people forming this wonderful fabric of culture and experience that supports one another. Thank you for letting me share this wonderful story with you. For additional tools and resources, please visit my website at phaseworld.com, F-E-I-S-W-O-R-L-D. Without further ado, please welcome George Ko. <laughs> So I'm here with George. Uh, how to pronounce your last name correctly? Ko. Ko. Okay. Ko. Well, that's not bad. You gotta show me how you write it in Chinese. Oh. <laughs> Do you write in Chinese? Uh, uh, about sixty percent. It's it's okay. It's not it's not fantastic. I, I wish I could write more fluently, but that's not um, bad. At least though. I can speak it fluently. You, so if at any point you want to switch to Mandarin and. How, you know, test our listeners uh, Chinese, <laughs> that'd be fine. <laughs> awesome. Do you speak Mandarin at home by chance? Yes. Yeah, so actually, um, I'm the first generation born in my family. My uh, father and mother grew up in Taiwan, mm -hmm. and they uh, moved to this country, and I lived with my grandmother, and she doesn't speak very good English. So my parents made it a requirement that once you're in the home, you must speak Mandarin. Wow. So um, my brother, sister, and I, we grew up speaking Mandarin. And uh, so we're, when we have, whenever we go back to Asia, we're very comfortable. Uh, reading and writing, though, <laughs> is, is, is a little bit of a challenge. But. I can imagine. All of you guys are born and raised here. Yeah. Oh. I mean, here, in not Cal in Cambridge. In California, but yes. Nice. 
So you're originally from California, and mm -hmm. what brought you here seems to be Harvard, which is not a bad option. How did you select your colleges not so long ago, I guess? Well, uh, the funny thing about colleges is I actually, my first choice was not Harvard University, it was Columbia University. I have a, <laughs> a joint program with Juilliard, but most importantly, it's in New York City, mm -hmm. and I, I love New York. And um, I, since eighth grade, I was determined to go to Columbia. I had um, all the blue packets and the Columbia flag on my desk. Why is that? And I, I just fell in love with the school. My friend, uh, she, she actually went to Barnard, and she took me to a class in, at Columbia and just loved the environment. And um, so I was very determined. But the funny thing was I applied early decision, and I got deferred. And, you know, I felt that, okay, maybe I didn't get in. And then I was rejected from Juilliard, and then that was upsetting. Mm. But then uh, the funny thing is, so the last Wednesday of every March, uh, the colleges release all their decisions, national, you know, uh, decision day. And I received an email from Stanford, University of Pennsylvania, Wharton, uh, Columbia, Yale, Princeton, Brown, and they all rejected me. Unanimous. You're kidding me. No. And I, I was very disappointed, but I, you know, it's all right. I mean, I still got into some schools and, you know, I'm still fortunate to go to college. So I said, you know, it's, it's, it's a little upsetting, but it's fine. You know, <laughs> they probably have too many Asian people in, in those schools anyways. You know, it's, it's right. okay. That, that's right. And then I was walking to class mm. and on my iPhone, back then iPhone 4, and still old. <laughs> still, yeah, it's an <laughs> old phone. Um, and uh, I got a notification from Harvard University. So I checked the email, and I was expecting another rejection. And the first three words I, or words I wrote were, we are delighted. Mm -hmm. And then I read the next two sentences, and I, I was so excited, I ran around the whole school. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And um, it's funny that I got into Harvard because um, I actually applied as a joke. I, I didn't think I could get in. And I applied to Harvard University at 11.59 p.m. December 31st. Which is the last day? Which is the last minute possible. I mm. mean, it was due Janu mm. January 1st, but at that 12 a.m. mark. Mm. And I, uh, our, our school, has, my high school historically would only accept one, usually one student would go to Harvard, and that one student in my class got in in seventh grade. <laughs> so well, I, I, that, I thought, we'll save that story for another episode. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was there was no chance. Mm. But yeah, I applied and I asked my mom, "Do I should I just check the box on the common application?" She said, "Why not? Mm. I mean, it doesn't hurt." So thank God I checked that check box. Because this was the last school possible for you to. Did you get rejected by all the other schools you? No. So to? I was very lucky. I was um, accepted into Ross School of Business at UMich. Mm. I was accepted at the Stern School of Business at NYU, and I was also accepted as a um, trustee scholar at USC for the film school and the business school. So I, I, I didn't, <laughs> I mean, I, had, I was very fortunate. So I mean, even if I didn't get into Harvard, I would still be very happy. Um, wow. Just was a little nice icing on the cake. Wow, I had no idea. I mean, we only caught up for half an hour on the phone prior mm -hmm. to this. But isn't life interesting sometimes? It is. <laughs> where your journey takes you. Right. You know, um, as I mentioned yesterday, I was at a bridal shower earlier. Mm -hmm. And not really my forte. I, don't, I didn't know what to wear. And, and the funny thing is we had a, the simple game. And there were 40, 50 women at the party and you're supposed to answer these 25 questions and you fold your paper and drop it into a box. And then in the end, um, I guess one of the maids said, Faye, did you turn in your paper? I said, oh, I totally forgot. She looked at my paper, she said, okay, there are three questions you didn't answer. And it was really embarrassing, I was looking around and she, she filled them out for me just as a joke. And then um, the bride took one out of uh, the hat and it was me who won the first game. <laughs> So it's, um, I think it's just really, really funny. But I think the Harvard reward is much more significant. Oh, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's just, you know, I'm very fortunate. You know, it's, uh, 
you know, as an Asian American, you know, I grew up in that community where people were obsessed with the Ivy League and they say, you know, that's the goal of life mm -hmm. to go to these schools. But to be honest, it's, um, it's a wonderful opportunity, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But it's not the end goal. I mean, every serious professional I've ever met, Mm -hmm. Harvard, Harvardian or not, mm -hmm. were successful because of the person that they are. It has nothing to do with the institution. Mm -hmm. just so happens that Harvard selects candidates mm -hmm. that have similar roles to those who do succeed mm -hmm. in the professional world. Um, so I am I'm very fortunate. Um, but if I didn't get in, I, I think I would still be the same person as I am today. Yeah, five minutes in, I think you will be. And <laughs> You are only 20, 20 years old? I'm 22. 22. Good for you. You're wise beyond your years. Well, and you're very kind. <laughs> you know, I'm sure some people would say that, oh, because you're at Harvard, so you don't care. I'm sure you hear that sometimes. Mm -hmm. But it is true when you look around that there are a lot of dropouts from Harvard. Mm -hmm. You could argue they're very qualified, very smart, even before they got in. But it's really true now in 2015, I look around my friends, people are really influential in the world. And clearly not all of them graduate from Harvard or any of the other Ivy League schools. Right. So it's interesting. I'm, I'm just so glad to have you on my show, to be honest, and um, Asian American, and especially in the past 15, 10, 15 years, there are just so many success stories. Mm -hmm. And we share a voice. It's not just Chinese Americans, but also Vietnamese, and, you know, right. uh, Thai, and it's it's a um, it's a blossoming society, community, and it's incredible. So you're on my show because you're a very successful, I think, piano player, and um, was referred to me by Barry Alexander from an earlier episode of my podcast, and we both adore uh, Mr. Alexander. And tell us about your piano career. You have thousands of fans on Facebook. I see you travel all around the world. So, tell us what it what is like to be to be you. Well, uh, <laughs> maybe we should just start from the beginning of how I started playing piano. I actually, when I was young, I was diagnosed with a very serious case of ADHD, and uh, my mother. I went to the doctor and the doctor said, well, you know, this crazy kid, you probably need to give him some pills. But my mother refused. She didn't want to give drugs to, you know, a three, four-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. So she, she used to play piano and she remembered it was a art that required a lot of discipline. So she said to me, okay, I'm going to give you piano lessons. And the first piano lesson I had lasted five minutes. I, I could not sit on the bench. I would mm -hmm. just run around and try to get away. And, um, but my mom was very persistent, and I was very lucky the teacher that I had, uh, March Chen, she did not give up. You know, she, she would say, I'm at least going to get this kid to play 10 minutes on the piano before he starts running around. And, you know, it took a long time, and I finally was able to focus on one task. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got into piano. But at the same time, I hated classical music. I despise the thing. As a three-year-old, I forgive you. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't like Mozart, you know, going and, you know, going to concerts and being happy. But my mother did bring me to concerts when I was three. Mm. Then uh, the county where I grew up in, Orange County, they have this wonderful symphony, the Pacific Symphony. And they would have these um, afternoon concerts for kids, just for kids. And I went to those concerts starting when I was three. And I listened to Mozart symphonies, Berlioz, Beethoven, Shostakovich, but I still hated all of it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until when I was 13, uh, my mom, this is when Long Long, the, the famous Chinese pianist, was, uh, just had this huge spur of fame. And my mother got tickets in San Diego, and we, we, got, we arrived late at the concert. I, I really didn't want to go. I wanted to go play Pokemon in the car. <laughs> And uh, my, and we weren't allowed inside because we arrived late. Mm -hmm. My mom begged the doorman, you know, look, we drove four hours here because of traffic. I bought these tickets a year ago. Can I at least let my son go listen because he plays the piano? And the doorman said, fine, but you just have to be quiet. So my mom pushed me through the doors. I walked into the hall. And then I heard the most beautiful thing in the world. And I, I was stunned. I, 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 was sitting, I was supposed to sit in row F, but I just stood in the aisle. And I didn't move. I was stunned by the music. 
and I'll never forget, it was the second movement of Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. And that's when I first really started appreciating classical music. Um, and uh, that's when I started to gain interest to play the piano. Um, but never had I thought I'd be a concert pianist or a pianist of any nature. I um, was still very heavily focused on my entrepreneurial pursuits. Um, what was that? And so, I, so, so when I was growing up, my, my father, he's, he's an entrepreneur, and he, he would, you know, I, when I was five years old, he gave me my first briefcase. When I was eight years old, I made my ho first hotel reservation. Wow. When I was 10 years old, I made my first sales call. When I was 12, I was his temporary accountant. I, I, I just want to clarify these don't violate any child, child labor laws. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, but you know, I learned a lot from him, and I, I did business in China. I, I looked at manufacturing in the Guangdong province, and you know, I um, so I was very interested in business, and which is why, as I mentioned earlier, all the schools I applied to I were mainly business focused. I never thought I'd be a pianist; I just thought it'd be a thing I'd do for fun on the side. Mm. And um, so, coming to Harvard, I was an economics major. And I founded four startups, and two of them did quite well, the other two, <laughs> not so much. Since you started um, at Harvard. Since I started at Harvard. And I did that in the span of my freshman year and half of my sophomore year. And during my sophomore year, I, I was extremely depressed and not happy with myself. I, I didn't know why. I thought what, what I did was what I loved. And, and um, you know, it's funny how life throws these special moments, you know, and these interesting turning points. I, in the fall of my sophomore year, I was sitting in Sanders Theater at Harvard, and the Boston Philharmonic came and gave a concert. And uh, Ben Zander conducted the fourth Brahms Symphony. And for some reason, after I heard that symphony, I knew from that moment, I have to be a musician, mm. either a pianist, or if I can't make it as a pianist, at least a conductor. Wow. There and I go. said, I have to give up mm. business. I have to give up my entrepreneurial endeavors. And so I, I hung that coat up. And, uh, and when I finished my sophomore year, I, I asked my parents to do a very unconventional Chinese-American thing, which is, can I take a year off to study piano? And um, because I've never really studied piano seriously in my whole life, you know, I just play you know, one hour a week and play in the talent show. Um, and uh, and it, they, had, they had this considerable thought, and I'm very lucky I have very um, considerate parents. And they said, fine, we'll, we'll support you and we'll help you with this one year and to cultivate your skills. And mm -hmm. so that's what I did for a year, was to learn how to practice the piano, just like a five-year-old again, learning to play the piano, but how to play to be a professional. And it, it was very hard, um, but now I'm very thankful with the teachers that helped me, uh, John and Mina Perry. They, um, they had a lot of patience to teach me professional work at the piano. And from that, it led to where I am now. So that's kind of a quick story. That's a great. <laughs> That's a great journey in a nutshell, and wow, you know, sometimes I feel like I ask the next question too fast, and that story in just a few minutes kind of triggered a lot of different ideas, and you know, you, by the time that you realized you wanted to be a musician, that must have been age 20, 21? That was when I was uh, 20. 20. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, age 20 is very interesting. I happen to have um, a cousin and a very close family friend who are just that age. And it's a difficult age to be. And mm -hmm. I'm very glad that I feel like your audience kind of span across a pretty different age range. But I want people in college to kind of listen to this. Because when I look back, when I was 20, I, I was very anxious. And I was even more anxious that I have to hide that feeling for the longest time. <laughs> and right. you're not too far from that. But tell me about that moment and that year. It was a magical year for you that you mm. left Harvard. 
And did you live in California? Did you stay in Cambridge? So, so yeah, my uh, my parents were very kind to uh, house me for the year. Nice. Um, so yeah, so I actually studied with uh, Mina Perry um, when I was in California, and um, she really you know helped me continue my interest in piano and develop a really good foundation. Um, and uh, and so I just thought naturally I would study with her and her husband, you know. Uh, for the year off, so I just stayed. I stayed in California mostly, mm -hmm. um, but surprisingly, um, my musical education for that year was fostered by um, my high school, the high school that I attended. So I attended this small private school called St. Margaret's from preschool through twelfth grade, and I've been at that school for <laughs> sixteen years. Oh man! And. Um, and at that time, they built a brand new concert, uh, performing arts center, and they have a 450-seat concert hall. Mm. And they asked me to help them select a piano. So I went to the factory in Steinway, and I helped select their piano. And, and But they actually were very supportive of my year off. They would welcome me back to give talks, um, play with some of their groups. And then at the end of the year, I played a solo recital at the hall um, to showcase the work I did for my year off. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different factors that helped support that. Um, I guess in terms of the struggle, mm -hmm. you know, I think we all feel this despite where we're at, especially at a young age. Um, we tend to, we like to compare, you know, we like to say, oh, that person's better than me, how can I be better than them? Well, when I started my year off, I, I've been to a lot of piano festivals, and I've listened to these 13-year-old girls, you know, mm -hmm. um, play, I mean, pieces of ridiculous uh, caliber, I mean, like, uh, pieces like... Uh, yeah. I mean, like, you know, someone who is 20 would try to do that, you know, 20, you know, 30, 40 years ago, but I mean, the 13-year-old girls that play that, you know, the Chopin etudes, like, it's nothing. Um, and um, so, so, you know, I, I always question myself, is this the right path? Am I doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. And um, at the same time, I was being uh, very fortunately bombarded with op internship opportunities at, you know, LinkedIn and Google and, and, and you know, I would turn them down because I was so determined, I'm so determined to be a musician and, and people would question, you know, people would question you, well, are you why would you do that, you mm -hmm. know? And I, you know, I would ask myself that same question. Why would I do that? I mean, these are opportunities people would die for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's so hard to get a job, especially now because of the rise of accessibility to education. Um, I mean, everyone's resumes are incredible. So how do you survive in such a competitive field? And so these were all questions that happened during the year off. And um, the most important thing I learned at least was you have to stop comparing mm -hmm. and you have to start connecting with people mm -hmm. you know you have to get help when you need help and don't be afraid to ask for help and not forget what's the most important thing in life and aside from religion you know if we keep the spirit spirituality aspect out of it, the most important thing in life is people because once you die there's, I mean, all your accomplishments are gone, but the, the relationships you had were the, probably the most treasurable things. And so my year off really folk told me, you know, your work is important, but your time with people is important. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was a good time to reconnect with my family and my friends. And in that way, I, I learned what music can really do. You know, I, we, we, there's this... Uh, hyper popularized view of classical music today where uh, in, at least in the classical field where it has to be hyper virtuosic you know is you have to win this competition there's a very specific set of rules of how to play the piano but we forget you know music is organic it's it's an expression of the human soul as cliche as it sounds you know it's a we call it the universal language and it's universal because you don't need to speak it to understand but if we play like, you know, robots and conform ourselves to this system, 
then we're not playing music anymore. It's, it's just a, a, a really nice, clean recording. Um, and so, you know, I think had it not been for my journey through understanding people during my year off, I don't think my music could have gotten any better or I could have understood the piano even more. That, that's some deep thinking in there. <laughs> no, this is incredible because I released 19 episodes of my podcast, working in the mm -hmm. 20th one. So far, I've interviewed two musicians. You know, one is Bear Alexander, mm -hmm. and the other is Ralph Peterson Jr., mm -hmm. who is um, in his early 50s and have been playing drums his whole life, mm -hmm. also plays the trumpet. And he cool, his quote is, he wants to be a musician's musician. <laughs> so I thought it was really interesting. And his interview is two parts, an hour and a half. And his idea is if you only, the connection to people is very, very important. But if you're in music career or if your understanding of music is somehow steered by the audience with the intention just to simply impress them, mm -hmm. to be liked by them, then when they change, your music has to change, mm -hmm. and therefore you can no longer be you. Mm -hmm. But that, that's very interesting. So I feel like you're at this really interesting intersection that for someone as young as you are, you know, I feel like I'm learning a lot being 10 years older than you are to know that it's just as important to connect with people and yet really believe in what you do. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, I always think about it as, um, you, you need courage to do that. Yeah. And sometimes I say this to people that especially when you're Asian or Chinese American, you need more courage because, you know, you could be in Orange County and, you know, and even Boston, you know, we're surrounded by, let's just say Americans, you know, there are a lot of the Caucasian population in, in Boston is still very significant, obviously more significant than the Asian population. And the bridal shower I went to was um, a colleague, an ex-colleague of my, Helen, and everybody at the, the bridal showers was Asian. I noticed that and I started cracking up and you realize just the way that you grew up, and I can't quite say that because I, I grew up in Beijing in China, there is tremendous amount of pressure in a positive way influenced by the families. They want you to do well, mm -hmm. they want you to marry well, they want you to have a really nice job. So right. they don't worry about any of these things. And they, they mean really well. But for us, for you in particular, to break out of that pattern, your parents, granted, very supportive. But mentally, the must have been, I think is more challenging than like a, an average American to really s step out and, and step up mm -hmm. to what you're doing. Well, I think, you know, it's, um, you know, actually one of the things you touched on, uh, one thing I am very passionate about is, um, is Asian American culture. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I grew up at a, I went to an Irvine Chinese school uh, every uh, Sunday. Um, my, my parents are very active in the Chinese American Museum. Uh, my father helped found the new Irvine Chinese School, um, you know, so we're very, and he's also a member of the Committee 100, which is the organization of the leading Chinese Americans in the U.S. Whoa. And um, so, so we're very passionate about this subject, yeah. and um, he's also helped a couple of candidates get into office, um, most recently of which is um, Ted Liu and uh, Judy Chu, and Judy Chu is the first Chinese American woman in the Congress. and. You know, it is it is harder as an Asian American with all these different struggles. I mean, you have the view of old world China, right? Which is, you know, in Chinese we have this phrase, "du su du su xi," right? Mm -hmm. Like only a scholar, only mm -hmm. one who studies academics, mm -hmm. is of the highest, you know, uh, the highest peak of society. You know, um, and and then this idea to succeed through scholarship. You know, it's it's a it's a good aspiration, um, but the methods in which get you there, that's where it's questionable, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Long Long is very famous for having a very hard childhood because of the way he was brought up. I mean, he was very stern, it required a lot of physical abuse, mental abuse, and it's still prolonging in Asia today. Not just China. I mean, mm -hmm. South Korea, Taiwan, mm -hmm. Singapore. Um, but you know it's 
we have to start getting away from that. You know, there, there's a way to discipline children without resorting to that kind of methodology. Um, but more importantly, as an Asian American in the U.S., um, it is, you get the struggle of, you have to represent mm -hmm. your culture, you have to educate people about your culture, um, and you have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone to fight for your voice. I think that's really important. Um, as an Asian, as in the, for my Asian side of being Asian American, we're taught to be very restrained, not submissive, but restrained. Um, I think that's a, a that's a viewpoint that a lot of um, uh, Americans misunderstand. Asian, as, as a, at least as a Taiwanese and Chinese, we're taught to be restrained. We're taught to exercise our mental control over our emotions. Mm -hmm. When something does not please us, we don't attack, we reflect. Mm -hmm. And we reflect on ways how we can improve the situation without resorting to such confrontation. Um, and, you know, even though the United States is much better than 40 years ago, I, there's still racism. Uh, I, I still face it. Um, I think we all have had our own share. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to find, as you said, that courage to educate people, you know, what it means to be Asian American, what it means to mm -hmm. be Chinese or Taiwanese, you know. Uh, t you know, the, the nice thing about being in America is you drive five minutes, there's Chinese food, another five minutes is Japanese food, and mm -hmm. you can show people your culture. And I think um, what what at least the minorities as our, you know, I guess an extra responsibility is to show people our culture mm -hmm. and to show them that, you know, being in this ethnic group and this culture is part of being American, mm -hmm. you know, and I think this is especially important in this time because there's a lot of, you know, um, kind of this pushing away of Asia in modern society today, especially in the news. I mean, you pull up any newspaper today and they'll it'll have a headline saying, you know, Asia is the economic enemy. Asia, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I mean, yeah, that may make headlines, but you might send the wrong message to other Americans of different ethnic groups. You know, it's, we can't forget that the America is a melting pot. Mm -hmm. And we are not just one type of people. We're a group of many people supporting together, you know, this wonderful fabric mm -hmm. uh, across the country. Um, so, you know, I guess that, that would be another, I guess the burden of an Asian American is to find that voice, to find that, that, that duty to, to share a culture and not be afraid. Mm -hmm. um, we are one, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I, when I interviewed Matt Lindley, who's a director of innovation at Sapien, mm -hmm. there's one story, and there are many other stories from my podcast. I literally wake up, I think about them. When I go to sleep, I think about them. And one of the stories he said was a um, true story, um, is looking at Earth from space, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, astronauts are thinking, it's not them and us anymore. It's us. Mm -hmm. You know, and that this type of conflicts not only happen based on different ethnicities, but even at like a marketing agency that I work for, right? Mm -hmm. There is a struggle between your traditional, I'm digital, you know, you are you work on TV, I'm working on, on digital campaigns. We are one, and if we can just come together, think about how much we can learn from one another. Mm -hmm. And I notice one of the things that I I feel so spoiled to be living here in the United States, in Boston, and just the fact that you walk down the street, mm -hmm. and Harvard is, a, it is an extreme example of mm -hmm. this, is you, you literally walk down Mass Ave right now, you could probably meet people from 20, 25 countries. Right. Isn't it amazing? I mean, even the people who look just like you, they could be from a Nepal, different... or they could be from, you know... I mean, people forget there are 52 ethnicities in China. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like, uh, I have a lot of friends from uh, Ru Muqi mm -hmm. and, and uh, Xinjiang. And, um, you know, they, none of them look Han. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's, uh, it's funny, you know. And, um, like, I, I would show my roommates photos of these people. I'd say, hey, you know, this guy's from China. He's like, well, he looks like he's a Kurd. I'm like, nope, he's mm -hmm. Chinese. Mm -hmm. And... Um, 
so yeah it, it, you're you're right you know it's um we're very lucky mm -hmm. and so um but yeah i think we you know more of that more of that coming together um you know it's um that kind of support is a positive influence mm -hmm. and uh you know if i i believe with the just watching how many more Asian Americans are participating in politics, mm -hmm. um, in nonprofit work, to be active about this education. Mm -hmm. I, th I think, you know, it's, uh, I mean, the world will be a better place, and it, it is, it's, but it's, um, it will get even better. Yeah, absolutely, and when you said, I love the example you said, you know, when you stand up on the stage playing the piano or doing anything else, people judge you differently. And in your mm -hmm. your own people in this case, if I'm, I'm on the audience, I really feel a sense of pride. And I'm just as happy to see people from every ethnicity out there. But when they when I see Chinese flag in the United States now, very different feeling than when I see the Chinese flag in China. Mm -hmm. I, I probably wouldn't even notice it. And I was listening to this interview, Charlie Rose, I believe, interviewing Chris Rock. <laughs> And I was like, Chris Rock is my hero. And he said, you know, when I do a movie, uh, when I produce a movie, it's very different. I'm representing versus, and it has to be good. It has to be good. If Adam Sandler produces a movie that's no good, it's okay. Another week will be another okay, good movie mm -hmm. representing white people. But <laughs> Chris Rock was saying that I, at whatever I do, it has to be good. Just like Denzel Washington. It's not just working in a movie, you know. Yeah. And that part is really is really true, and it's um, it's quite interesting. And I think about this, and I'll give you this kind of a silly example. I remember when I was in fifth grade, and the story I could never forget. I probably forgot about everything else I learned that year. But <laughs> you know, my teacher said that on the newspaper in um, I think in Milan, but one of the airports in Europe, probably in Italy that all the signs, messages says, welcome in Spanish, welcome in English. And when there was, there's one line for Chinese, it's like, don't spit on the floor, you know? Mm -hmm. And that really hit me in a way. So I think as soon as I, when I arrived in the country, I, I kept thinking about things like that. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to behave in a certain way that, not that I spit on the, the floor when I was in China, but uh, I was always very careful. I was raised in a, in a way by my grandparents, and my parents were very strict about these things. Mm -hmm. And they took it to a next level, but I thought, we need to change the image for, for Chinese people. Yeah. So, you know, back to you. I, I feel like it's really, it's really incredible what you're doing. And I, you know, you're very, very humble. Um, and I feel like I can get only so much information about you, your journey, playing the piano, and you have thousands of fans on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And every time you post a picture or you're at an airport and people, you're dropping comments, they're cheering for you. And thousands of people, many of them are not families and friends, close friends, mm -hmm. but they are now. They're supporters. They're from every ethnicity, every background. Mm -hmm. So tell us about sort of where have you traveled to and, and how, what is the dynamics like between you and the people? Because you talk mm -hmm. about experience all the time. Yeah, and so one, one, I guess, philosophy of playing that I really believe in mm -hmm. is, I, I first of all don't believe you should ever, and as, as that other, as that drummer said, you should never conform your music to some kind of public desire. And what I mean by that is, if you can play a beautiful passage at one, you know, okay speed, you know, if you can play, you know, you know, without playing super fast and you're happy, that's great, but don't play it out just to make it a more poppy or something that mm. that cheapens the art form you know that that I'm totally against but what I'm totally for is a style of playing that engages people and your goal is that when you finish playing doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made because it doesn't matter how good of a piano player you always make mistakes mm -hmm. um, is that when you finish that concert someone walks away from that 
and is inspired in some way. And, and I hope it reminds them at least of something important in their life, that they not just went there to enjoy a piece of entertainment, but they went to you know, enjoy the music as a piece of reflection. For me, playing piano is like going to church or wherever your religious place is. And if you're not religious, wherever you like to meditate or just to relax, you know, I want it to be a sanctuary. I want it to be a place where you can laugh, you can cry, you can um, enjoy all the things that we enjoy in life. And I think that's the most important thing of how to connect with people. Um, and I think, you know, when I travel to all of these places, you know, I've been, you know, when I go to Bali or I go to Puerto Rico or I go to Italy or France or Germany and I play for those audiences, mm -hmm. I never change the way I play. I have never in my entire life changed the way I play. Mm -hmm. Well, the responses I get are all the same. And I'm very lucky that I've been blessed with a communicative ability at the piano. And, you know, I, I will never forget I was... Um, I was playing, let's see, where was I playing? Uh, I was playing, oh yes, I was playing in Italy, of all places. And it was actually at Mr. Al one of Mr. Alexander's festivals of Mr. Cosmo Buono, as you know, from the Alexander Buono Empire. <laughs> uh, I, I hope they don't harp for me for that comment. Uh, but, you know, um, I played uh, the Heroic Polonaise by Chopin. <laughs> Uh, and I played that for an Italian audience, as I, th I thought. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, after I played, this old lady came up to me. And she spoke in English to me. She says, I'm actually from Poland. Mm -hmm. And I lived through World War II. And the way you play Chopin's heroic polonaise, which Chopin wrote for one of the Polish Moors when he was in residency in France, um, when you played that piece, it reminded me of my time in that war. And that's all she said. And she nodded and she left. And for me, that was more meaningful than the, any applause or any you know, accommod, you know, accolade after that. For me, that was, I was extremely touched um, by first her courage to come and tell me this, but that my music was able to do that for her. And, and then, I, then I realized, I think I don't remember how old I was, I think it was like 13 or 14, and I realized, hey, music's, this is, this is important, you know, this, this is a way to touch people. And, and if, you can, if I can play this way for someone in Europe, I probably can affect the same way as someone in Asia. And, I, I, and it works, I mean, it's, People are people. Mm -hmm. It's not you have to play fast or play in a certain style to make people happy. If you do something that touches them, everyone would feel it. Mm -hmm. And I actually, one thing Mr. Alexander said that taught, taught me that was very true, and he says, you know, if someone doesn't like the things you do, that's fine. There's enough musicians. They can go on the next, you know, the next track on Spotify. It's not a big, <laughs> it's not a big deal. So that's, I guess that's my answer is, um, my, my job is to not just provide a source of entertainment, but to touch people. If I touch people, that's great. And if I wasn't able to touch them and they didn't like my music, I'm very sorry. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, my, my role model for this, I, I guess, would be Yo-Yo Ma. You know, many, many classical musicians criticize him for all the artistic interpretations that he decides to do. But they all unanimously cannot disagree on one thing, which is that he's a great communicator. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why he sells out seats at Boston Symphony Hall. It's not because he's got the greatest technique. It's not just because he has a fantastic sound. It's because when you listen to his music, it's like, you know, looking back at your life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you walk in there and you see 80-year-old people walking out, I mean, crying, um, remor like, overjoyed by such wonderful music and for me that's the greatest musician is one who can communicate to people on that level um, so anyway don't, so. No, don't rush yourself <laughs> you have an obligation 
Mm. And I don't mean in a negative way, but this is very positive because, you know, it, it's like, I know, uh, this is adorable German Shepherd, I feel like she's in my life and she's not my dog, but I, I feel like we, some people on earth have the mentality of a German Shepherd is that you need something to do, you need an obligation. Um, you're on duty and people like you can play the piano the way you do, not just play but to feel the way you feel and to enjoy the entire process. Now you have an obligation to be able to trigger and enable and enlighten people like myself who don't play the same way. And you know the funny thing is for people like us or the old lady that you mentioned in, in Italy, out of all places, that they didn't even know what's going to trigger that part in their hearts. They don't know what is going to do it. And you know, a lot of the times you you walk around in 2015, it's been around, you know, it's been going on for five, ten years, and everybody you notice on their phone all the time, right? <laughs> We're all guilty of it. I do it too sometimes. <laughs> oh, me too. We're all guilty. We're all guilty because we cannot, many of us cannot quote-unquote suffer from our own thoughts. Like, we cannot be alone with, with our, by ourselves. Mm -hmm whether you're on the train, whether people are at my meetings, and thank God doesn't happen all that often, and, <laughs> you know, in other meetings and other venues. I mean, people will pay a significant amount of money to go see a drama, to go see a concert. You look down, you, you can see a light shining in their face. It's their cell phone turned on. Mm -hmm. So I think you have an obligation. I love the fact that you're playing. You're young, and you're playing, and you are you are, I don't want to say one of the few, but if you look at just the volume of people mm -hmm. from X number of years ago compared to people in their 20s and their teens that are practicing religiously as you do now, I, I believe the number has possibly been significantly reduced. And I would love to see the number, number go back up again because, you know, my mom, who's in her early 60s, and she, just like you, she practiced uh, painting, oh, okay. artistry for six, 10, 12 hours a day. And she is who she is today. And a lot of these skills, whether it's piano or art, in her line of work with res restoration and reproduction, they are lost. These skills are, are lost. They were cared by these masters, and many of them have you know, passed away. And you have an obligation to really pass on that knowledge, and at the same time, touch people in a way that you didn't think that you could. Yeah. I don't think I don't think any of these stories are something that were any of your goals. Like I, I would imagine when you're 19, you, you made that decision to say, okay, I got boxes to check. <laughs> Old lady must be completely impressed. Must travel to Italy. You know, you didn't have the set of expectation. And right. but if you knew, I could say there could be motivators. But the fact that you persevered through what may be arbitrary or a question mark at the time. But only very quickly later on realize everything's just blossoming without your goal or expectation of anything. That's beautiful. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's um, so just being a student at Harvard makes me a type A person. I mean, that, that's unanimous. Mm -hmm. If you're here, you're a type A person because you worked your butt off to get here. Don't lie about it. Right. <laughs> but, you know, one thing we have to forget to try to always do is create that big mega goal, you know, and start making small goals. But if you if you have the intention, you know, my mother always said, if you have the intention of doing something well for the good of people, rewards will always come, you know. And it's um, it's hard to see that immediately. I mean, we're there's a reason why we stare at our phones here, right? We, we love instant gratification. We want to be instantly entertained. We want. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want a time to think on our own. We don't want a time to ponder on our thoughts because it's terrifying. I mean, come on, can you think of riding on the subway and you're sitting down, you're talking in your head, okay, crap, now I have to talk to myself. What am I going to think about? Oh, man, that I essay successful. I have to write. Am I successful? Man, that other kid just want to know about prize the other day. You know, <laughs> you can't. Um, it's, it's terrifying because we don't want to face fear. But fear is what makes us stronger, you know, and uh, um, yeah, I, th I feel that, you know, the comment about the piano, um, so actually, 
uh, factually speaking, there are a lot more people playing piano now. Mm. Um, there are 42 million pianists in China. So, but it's not rising in the U.S., mind you. It's rising in Asia. Mm. So, um, and so the, you know, there's a joke in the classical music world. You go to a piano competition. First place is Chinese. Second place. Our third place is Korean or Chinese, and the second place guy is always that one Caucasian guy from America, Russia, or <laughs> Europe. You know, that's the joke. But the truth is, it's decreasing in those two continents, you know, the U.S. and uh, Europe. It's the less and less pianists. Mm -hmm. um, but even with this rise of pianists from Asia, there's not a rise in the emphasis of playing the piano for the sake of playing the piano. It's playing piano for the sake of winning a competition, getting into Juilliard, mm -hmm. and um, making money. Making, making money. money. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, Long Long gave a master class at the Central Concert in Beijing, and there was 3,000 people, and he asked them, how many people here think you can be famous from playing piano? And everyone rose their hand. And he said, you know, this is the problem. Mm -hmm. We, as a musician, you must play the piano because you love music. And Mitsuko Uchida, another very famous pianist, she said in an interview that, you know, to be a musician, to be in this profession, is not, is not a career choice. It is a calling. It is something you must do. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of conviction you need to be a musician. And I think that's forgotten in this hyper-popularized myth that if I be a violinist, I could be the next Itzhak Perlman. You know, it's... They, they forget, hey, there are a lot of people in this orchestra that are not Isaac Perlman's, but they're, they're still in that orchestra every day playing. And mm -hmm. the reason is because they love what they do. Mm -hmm. And so to, to remove our cap of the salary you want versus wh what I want as a fulfilled life, I mean, that's the, that's the hardest part, mm -hmm. right? That's the hardest part to, um, to try to differentiate. In part two of my interview with George, he talks about the business side of things. After founding four startups in just one and a half years, I figured that George could share some secret ingredients that contributed to his success today and inspire musicians like himself. At age 22, he has a clear vision of where this journey is going to take him and what he really hopes to accomplish. It is not as simple as just being the musician himself. It is rather a universal message that is going to change music and music education around the world. Find out more in the next episode. Thank you for listening. To listen to more episodes of the Face World podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or visit faceworld.com. That is F E I S W O R L D, where you can find show notes, links, other tools, and resources. You can also follow me on Twitter at Face World. Until next time, thanks for listening.